Hello and welcome to today's fourth quarter economic update. We're here with Cameron Cook, Justin Fisk, and Chris Karam to review market activity in the third quarter. This pre-election perspective focuses on what we're seeing as we move from rebound to recovery, with an eye towards sustainability as we go into the fourth quarter. Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Sarah. And clearly the story of the year is the status of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And uh, here you'll see that although cases continue to rise here in the U.S., we have seen a continued precipitous decline of the death rate. And that's critically important as we look into the fourth quarter of 2020 and into the, the years 2021 and beyond. Future economic growth actually is going to be highly dependent we believe, on the successful approval and delivery and dissemination of the COVID-19 vaccine or vaccines. And it's really about getting consumers more confident in the ability to do what we did in our daily lives pre-COVID, whether it is traveling through airports, seating inside a restaurant. If you look at where we were pre-COVID, in some cases, we retrenched north of 95, 96, 97% of activity. We've rebounded but we haven't quite had the confidence, consumer confidence necessary to go out and about and travel freely and safely without the fear uh, of potentially picking up COVID-19. So this is a good example of how the delivery of a successful vaccine uh, would really potentially pick up our daily economic lives and economic activity back to hopefully pre-COVID levels. To give you a sense of how that's impacted the unemployment situation, the labor market had a very discouraging report back when COVID-19 really impacted weekly jobless claims. Our unemployment rate shot up north of 14%. The latest reading is about 7.9%, which is a great improvement from where we were just a few months back. And along the way, you can see that sentiment as the unemployment rate began to fall, in fact, significantly fall the last few months, that sentiment began to stabilize and actually improve. And that's critically important for our economic prospects moving forward. You can see, however, that pre-COVID levels of unemployment were south of 4%, closer to 3.5%. We're on the right track, but it's going to take us a while to get back to where those pre-COVID levels were in the labor market. The Federal Reserve and Congress both were very active early on during the COVID-19 crisis. So back in the first quarter, the Federal Reserve wasted no time in taking interest rates down to zero, but have since taken other accommodative measures to balloon their balance sheet north of $7 trillion. This is substantial. It's raised an enormous amount, trillions of dollars of liquidity into the capital markets, which not only stabilized credit markets, but also helped fuel some of the rebound that we've seen in the equity markets beginning at the end of the first quarter, throughout the second quarter, and in through the third quarter as well. Congress also passed a variety of relief and stimulus measures in response to COVID-19 and highlighted by the 2.2 trillion plus CARES Act that was passed earlier this year. Unfortunately, although that helped stabilize markets for sure uh, and stabilize in many cases our citizens and our industries and our consumers, it did lead to what the Congressional Budget Office projects to be for the September 30th fiscal year end for the government, a $3.3 trillion budget deficit. So we're right now in the middle, of course, of a general election year. Congress trying to negotiate an additional multiple trillion dollar package of additional relief and stimulus measures. And so these federal budget deficits could be here to stay for a while of this magnitude. And hopefully they'll come down in future after a successful delivery of a vaccine. So for more on the impact that COVID-19 has impacted the economy, but also the equity markets, I'm going to turn over to Justin Fisk. Thanks, Chris. On the next slide, we see quarter over quarter growth in US real GDP. Released at the end of September, the third estimate of second quarter GDP showed a decrease of 31.4% versus the first quarter, stated in annual terms. On the heels of a historic second quarter decline in GDP, the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now tool forecasts third quarter growth of over 35%. The first estimate of third quarter GDP growth will be released on October 29th and reported in our mid quarter update. 2020 real GDP is down 9% year over year. As we've discussed each quarter since the pandemic began, the next slide shows annual price returns and intra-year declines for the S&P 500. All the way to the right, we see the 34% intra-year decline that took place in the first quarter. Through September 30th, the S&P 500 has returned 4% year to date, excluding dividends. Moving on to asset class performance, this table reflects returns as of September 30th with year to date values in the third column from the right. Fixed income still leads, returning 6.8%. Large caps have returned 5.6%, and cash is slightly positive. 
The asset allocation portfolio, high yield, and emerging market equity all have negative year-to-date returns but with absolute values less than 1%. Developed markets have returned negative 6.7%. Small caps are down 8.7%. And commodities and REITs are both down just over 12% year-to-date. One question on the minds of investors is whether domestic equities may be overvalued and to what degree. The next slide shows the forward price to earnings ratio for the S&P 500. As of September 30th, the forward PE ratio is 21.54 times earnings, which is 1.6 standard deviations above the 25 year average PE of 16.46. Price to cash flow is also elevated coming in at 15.19, more than two standard deviations above the 25 year average of 10.7. Next, I'll turn it over to Cameron to share how specific sectors of the S&P 500 have performed. Thank you, Justin. As you look at the performance of the various sectors of the S&P 500, all of the industries that you would expect to outperform so far this year have outperformed. Everything related to e-commerce and the digital economy has outperformed traditional cyclical industries like energy, airlines, hospitality, and banks. Less volatile sectors like healthcare, staples, industrials, and utilities are sitting near the break-even line so far this year. At some point, it may pay to be contrarian, but for the foreseeable future, the companies that are dominating the markets appear likely to continue taking share from more traditional players. The leaders in the market are the fan mag stocks, and they represent about 22% of the S&P 500. Those companies are Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. This narrow leadership reflects these companies' ability to scale and profitably dominate very large markets and move quickly into adjacent markets. The fan mag stocks have benefited from COVID, but their steep rise and the potential for a slowdown in their market share gains has slowed their ascent during this past quarter. Even as owning these stocks has been a big benefit for investors, the more that future growth is priced into these stocks, the more risk that represents for the markets and investors. As asset prices have inflated, inflation in the broad economy has remained low. In the Fed's view of the world, using personal consumption expenditures, inflation remains quite stable. Other measures of inflation, like the New York Fed's underlying inflation gauge, have indicated upward pressure recently, but have since turned down due to the fall in economic activity because of COVID-19 that Chris and Justin highlighted. The Fed is targeting a 2% average inflation rate, as they always have, but have more recently indicated that they will allow inflation to run a bit higher than the average to ensure that deflationary pressures have diminished. This low inflation environment has allowed the Fed to keep interest rates near zero. Looking at the yield curve, the yield curve drives a tremendous amount of economic activity through the credit markets. Last year at this time, the front end of the curve was inverted even after the Fed had begun to telegraph its neutral policy stance. The inverted curve had more to do with short-term funding issues in the interbank market than it did with economic growth. Fast forward to this year and the curve is steeper, which should be a positive for the credit-led expansion of the economy, but rates are also historically very low due to the economic slowdown caused by COVID-19. Because the slowdown has been caused by a shock from outside the economic system, as opposed to your garden variety financial crisis, economic activity will not likely be as responsive to low interest rates. That said, there are glimmers of hope in the real estate market as home prices are supported by low rates and are even increasing in many areas of the country as people buy homes in the suburbs and smaller cities. This shift out of major cities, if it remains somewhat permanent, could have political implications. As we turn our attention to the election on November 3rd, it's time to set our expectations around the election results and what they might mean for the market and the economy. The charts on this slide show the market returns and economic growth that have occurred when one party takes control of the executive and legislative branches. Since World War II, when the Republicans have controlled both branches, the markets have fared better than when Democrats do. In contrast, when the Democrats are in control, the broader economy tends to do better. Interestingly, when the executive and legislative branches are split between the parties, the markets and the economy tend to not do as well. Even so, the returns are decidedly positive. In a highly polarized environment, people often want to trade their politics. It's important to remember that history shows markets do well when either party is in control and when the government is divided. So if you're one of those people, you're better off to resist that temptation. And with that admonition, I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thanks, Cameron. We'll be back mid-quarter for another market update. If you're interested in receiving additional plan sponsor insights, you can subscribe to our newsletter using the link below.